Well, it is absolutely wonderful to be here. And I do not mean that in any way lightly, because number one, we are actually here in a room in person, which is just fabulous. Um, and uh, number two, I think the last time I came to an NHSR conference in person, there was physically no Python community. So it is absolutely wonderful and testament to so much hard work by a few very important people, I think we know who, that we are, abs we are sat here in a room today with a packed schedule ahead of us to discuss all things Python. And, and that is absolutely remarkable and amazing. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. So I'm Sarah Culkin, as Mary said. I'm um, the Deputy Director of Data Science and Analytics. What that actually means is I head up a team of people <laughs> um, that used to sit in what many of you may remember as an organisation called NHS um, X. So NHS X was set up about three years ago. It was a joint unit that brought together colleagues from NHS England and the Department of Health and Social Care. And its intention was to look after all things digital transformation on behalf of the health and care sector. Um, at the time, I was working in, in NHS England um, and um, was actually working in a data policy team. And so was one of the NHS England colleagues that moved across to that unit. However, up until the that role, I have spent my entire career working as, as an analyst and a data scientist in either the Department of Health and Social Care or, or in the NHS. Um, I, I joined the Department of Health straight from um, university where I'd, I'd done a PhD in chemistry, so it was a slightly different move, but numerate none, nonetheless, um, and has spent my time in many, many different uh, roles, right from, I think when I first started, producing endless performance reports, looking at all kinds of different, uh, different measures that they wanted to measure the NHS for at the time. I think a particular highlight and, and favorite metric at that time uh, was whether um, a patient had had a packed lunch given to them if they were discharged before lunchtime, which is just, just beautiful, isn't it? Um, so, yes, spent a lot of time in the NHS, and it was actually in the Department of Health that um, I first came across a, a subject or a, a, a topic called data science and um, got very excited about it. And long story short, managed to convince the chief analyst at the time to set up a small data science team, um, and uh, that was in around 2015. Uh, at the same time, um, the Government Digital Service was running... A, a data science accelerator program which is still operational today and many people in this room I can see lots of nods um, <laughs> may have even taken part and I know for a fact a few of my colleagues are even uh, mentors on the program so um, number one if, if you are starting out in your data science journey do check that out because it is absolutely open to all public sector workers in court including people that work in, in health and social care in the NHS but number two the reason I tell you this rambling, rambling anecdote is because this is when I first became aware of and had my first interaction with something called Python in 2016 on the, the Data Science Accelerator. And um, I'm not going to lie to you, I had done a bit of uh, programming in R before then, but this was my first interaction. I, I'd, I'd applied to the scheme, I'd got accepted, I was going to make an app. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> um, I did actually make what, what you could very loosely call, call an app using Python Flask, uploaded it to GitHub, it was deployed on Heroku, so it did work. I, I basically hacked, hacked it together, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, and I also used uh, Pandas for the first time and thought, as someone who'd used spreadsheets an awful lot before that point, what a nightmare is this? <laughs> Trying to get your data to load and you can't see your data and you've told it it's in some sort of format but actually someone stuck a load of nulls in what's meant to be a numeric column and it doesn't load and you can't see it. I just think this is an absolute nightmare. Nonetheless, I was with uh, a cohort of lots of other very nice uh, clever people including a particular chap who was from at what was now at the time was called Public Health England 
And um, at the end of, of the, the, the sort of accelerator program, we have to do a big presentation. And I remember sitting in the audience as he did his. And he, um, he and his team spent an awful lot of time putting together these big PowerPoint packs of public health information. Um, I think we did this once a year, and it was a whole range of different public health information that had to be given out to every different local authority or region. So it was cut by each different local authority. It came from everywhere. It was a huge cottage industry. Um, and he had to uh, uh, be part of this team. And so he thought, right, I've done data science accelerator. I can now use Python a bit. I am. I am taking this and I am, I am running with it. And I can I remember sat there to, the, to this day. His presentation was up here, a bit like this. Um, he called it something beautiful like moving at warp speed. It had a big picture of the, the, the enterprise on there. And he talked us through how he'd used Python to essentially automate the entire process of pulling in all the data, building the PowerPoint packs for each different local authority, press of a button, I remember just sat there watching it. He did some sort of video so you could see the, power, the PowerPoints being made in real time and being assembled. And it was genuinely like something out of Harry Potter, I remember. <laughs> you know, the scene where all the things in the kitchen are just moving around and the, all the cleaning's happening and you're just sat there having a coffee. It was, it was like that. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I think it was really at that point that I thought, OK, Python's very cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, for, fast forward. A few years, I find myself in NHSX being asked to set up um, an analytics team. And I was, I'm gonna, not, not going to lie, given a fair amount of leeway as to what that analytics team looked like. So when I said set up an analytics team, I, I said, I think you mean a data science and analytics team, and shoehorned in quite a lot of, a lot of uh, data science in there too. Um, and it was in setting up that team that I had the very, very, very good fortune of uh, employing uh, one Craig Shenton, who arrived with me as a data engineer, and also some truly awesome uh, apprentices in, in the way of, 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 of Mary, and also, at the time, um, another colleague, Aruba, who has also moved on to amazing things. In fact, all three of them have now sadly left us and gone on to bigger and better things, but I'm not surprised in the slightest. But it was in setting up that team, and um, they came to me one day, and I think Craig said, I've got this idea of setting up a Python community. It'll be a bit like the R community, but for Python. And I think at the time, I just went, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, lovely. Do that. And they really did. <laughs> they really, really did. And, and, yeah. and I just want to take a little moment to really pay tribute to the enthusiasm and hard work and, and just general brilliance of, of Craig and Mary and Aruba and all the people that have been involved in setting it up and, and Alex from Analyst, uh, Analyst X, who was also there from the word go, wasn't he? Um, and who's in Hong Kong today. So if I could just take a moment just to give those guys all a quick round of applause to say well done. <laughs> We are here. We have a Python community, um, and, and it is wonderful. And I just wanted to sort of draw your attention to my one slide for the day, which I think really sort of summarises what I've just said. That if something, sometimes if you want something to exist, you just have to make it yourself, which is a lovely example for this community. But it's actually also a very nice way of describing um, what you can do with Python, which is, to a certain extent, pretty much anything. Um, and we are going to hear today a whole load of examples of, of exactly that. I must give credit to, uh, to the, the makers of this badge, which is a group called the Arts Emergency, who are on Twitter and all of the social media platforms. I particularly came across this um, at a Joe Lysit gig I went to recently. So I don't know if many of you have also seen this same badge and how he talked about how, uh, how he kind of took inspiration from it. But I also thought it was quite a nice analogy for today. Um, okay, so the, today, believe it or not, there is more to this talk, um, I want to talk a bit about, essentially, to orientate yourself, a bit about the past, a bit about the present, and a, a bit about the future. I've probably covered quite a lot about the past already and how we've got here today. Um, so let's move on a little bit more to think about where we are here today uh, in, in the present. So we're here, we're having a, a, a a Python community talk for the first time ever, as I said, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and I'm also very pleased to see, shortly after me on the list, we have some other uh, titles that also have analogies to moving at speed. So I'm, I'm delighted that the, 
that the tradition continues. Um, so we have, I believe, um, Adam Kouthis, Turbocharge Your Development with Visual Studio Code. Lovely, lovely bit of turbocharging. And Mark Bailey with uh, A to B but faster. So very much enjoying all of that. And if anybody throughout the day is able to either get a Star Trek reference in or just a general reference about speed, then 10 extra points to, to you. Um, nonetheless, I'm sure that the other non-speedy titles will also be excellent. Um, but the Python community isn't the only thing that I think makes it very exciting to be a data professional in health and care at this moment in, in time. Um, the fact that, you know, the NHSR community exists and the NHSR community has helped the Python community to exist is a nice example of how things that go on historically, footsteps help, help others to, to grow and for, uh, for things to, to continue. And um, there's lots of things I think are, at the minute, starting to kind of build and mean that it is a very exciting time to be a data scientist, a data engineer, um, a data analyst in, in the health and care sector at, at the minute. Um, some particular things, not wanting to spend too much time plugging up my own unit, but I'm going to anyway. It, we also, as well as having a data science team in, in, the, in the unit, and we also have a data analyst team and some data engineers, we have specifically a work stream dedicated to developing um, data analytics as a profession. Um, this is led by someone called Sarah Blundell, who uh, if you, you may, have, may have come across, but um, she does a great amount of work trying to really develop what it means to be a professional working in data in, in the NHS. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about some of those things. Um, and a real key thing that we have done uh, recently is that we've been developing and testing out in the sector a set of competency frameworks. Now, this may sound like a fairly kind of obvious and potentially even dry thing to do, but I genuinely think that this is the, the, the foundations upon which a very strong, recognised and well-used data profession can be built for the health and care sector. The data science, the competency frameworks that we've built are um, for data scientists, data engineers and data analysts. And for those of you who are familiar with the DDAT, the Data, digital data and technology framework developed by GDS, you will note that they very beautifully map into the data family of that program. Um, and that is quite deliberate. Uh, we are intentionally trying to align with wider work going on that was originally led by HEE and commissioned by NHSX and is now a kind of HEE, NHS England kind of program looking at really strengthening and um, growing the, the wider digital workforce for health and care, recognising that actually a digital workforce is a really key part of, of digital transformation in, in health and care. And we think that the data family is absolutely a vital member and part of that digital transformation programme. So <clears throat> we have these competency frameworks uh, written. Um, the data science one, for example, I think has about six different competences that will take you f all the way from kind of your, your data engineering type skills, your coding skills, your understanding of analytical approaches, your ability to communicate your work. And it is, I think there's six competencies split about across those kinds of things. Um, and it's also done by a different level. So you can go right through from um, what a sort of an apprentice or new to new to sort of new to the role data scientists would be expected to be able to do at those different levels of competence, and will actually show you all the way up to a sort of depth director band nine head of service type role. That also exists for data analysts and data scientists, and so you can see that with these in place, you have a way to both join as a junior data scientist and see how your career could progress um, more senior in that same grade, or you could actually think as a data scientist or as a data analyst, I want to become a data engineer or a data scientist. How do I move across? And there's a consistent way to do that. And so this is what I mean when I say this is now a sort of a really solid foundation from which to grow this profession. 
once the competency framework exists, um, and it's in its very last stages of testing, it's just been tested out with about um, 44 different organisations across health and care, um, and the data science uh, framework was developed by a set of data scientists in, in health and care, which in itself is an exciting uh, development that we've got enough data scientists spread across different organisations that they can come together and write a, a data science competence together in itself is huge progress. Um, that's not where we want to stop. We want this to be used. We want it to be used in job descriptions, in, in, in development, but also crucially, we want it to form the absolute backbone of the training offer to people in health and care. And so we are involved in, with Mary as well, uh, all kinds of things to do with Python training, with our training. There's lots of other people in this space as well. I'm definitely not pretending we're the only people doing this because we're not. There's loads of good stuff out there. But what we actually need is a consistent way to map it and say, this particular piece of training here will contribute to this competency here that will allow you to move to this level here. And these are all the sorts of things that we, we, we think need to happen and we, we want to be part of. Um, we also uh, have the Analyst X programme, which I don't know if anybody of you have come across this before, but this is um, another thing that was set up during, during the pandemic um, at the time, just to share information on models and data that different analysts are using in different parts in response to the pandemic. And it has now been kind of converted to something that's called Analyst X. It has about 16,000 members, and it has on it a vast amount of, of, of L&D. Um, open to you for you know e-learning and different things and also loads of different um, events that happen huddles mini huddles there's machine learning Mondays um, the data science community is a sort of fledgling community on that which has now got its own kind of breakout website and area which again it may be of interest to those of you in the room um, so that is probably uh, where I will leave talking about the kind of the the present and what we're doing in terms of the, the profession but always happy to, to talk more. If, if you find me in the coffee break, I'm here all day. Um, but also, let's think a bit more about actually Python in the present day. Um, we've talked about, isn't it great that it's now here in the NHS, but obviously Python has been used for a very long time in very different, different ways, and in loads and loads of different industries and in very, very cool ways. So, for example, um, Google used Python a lot. But a little bit of audience participation, ready yourselves introverts, uh, because uh, <laughs> um, I thought first thing in the morning, second day of the conference, let's, let's, uh, let's get a little bit engaged. So if I may ask you, please, does anybody have any interesting examples or industries they know are using Python at the minute? I can see one already. Uh, I know that Instagram was originally built using Django, which is a Python framework. Nice. Thank you very much. Oh, one at the front as well, Andrew. You can do a mean line in modding Minecraft in Python if you really want to. Say that again. You can do a mean line in modding Minecraft if you really want oh, to in Python. Yes, you can. You can. That's true. My children told me that. You can hack the back end and make it rain diamonds. Yes, yes. Go it. <laughs> truth, truth. <laughs> Anybody else? Can anyone beat raining diamonds in Minecraft? Come on. What's on at the back? I'll just quickly say uh, you can save on your energy bills by writing your own thermostat program. Nice. That's topical. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else got anything to add? Go on, Johnny. You've got something. Um, I just think uh, any form of uh, any form of visualization, any form of layering up of um, all different sorts of uh, mapping tools, I really like to see. Um, yeah, the interactive nature that can come off the back of that, off the back of layering. Thank you. Okay, last call for fun or interesting or just any use of Python outside of health and care. You can you can do three D modeling with like Blender and Python. Thank you. There might be one at the front. I've got, you said fun, so I'm going to go for a fun one. Brilliant. My my son and I use Python to write an automatic Nerf gun. 
using a BBC oh. micro bit. That was lots wow. of fun. I'll show you the video. Okay. Mm. We're not going to be beating that anytime soon. So let's. <laughs> oh no, we have. We have got a. We've got a contender. <laughs> of course, uh, you can use it in Lego robotics along uh, C as well. But uh, definitely Python is very easy. Nice. Okay. The, 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 the one thing I was gonna, I found on my quick search of the internet was um, NASA's use of it, which is pretty cool and fun and amazing and all those kind of adjectives. Um, particularly with its program to put a rover on Mars, I believe it put stuff out on GitHub uh, to the community and, and they didn't realize they were doing it at the time, but they were helping to write um, the program for the for the drone, and then upon the successful use of the drone on Mars, the next day, all these people on GitHub had a special badge appear that they didn't know about that said that they'd officially helped uh, put a, a drone on Mars, which I thought was just amazing. Um, okay, thank you very much for your uh, your indulging me there and. I definitely learned some things about Nerf guns that I will not be telling my seven-year-old boy. <laughs> okay, so, present day, we've got a lot of stuff going on in data and analytics, in health and care, it's a beautiful time to be alive. We've got Python being used in Nerf guns and putting mm -hmm. drones on Mars. Um, so, let's think a little bit more about the future for the last bit of my my talk, and I guess where I get a little bit more serious, really, because um, the future holds, I think, probably all kinds of things that almost certainly are going to be involving an awful lot of a Python. It got discussed a little bit yesterday, if you were here for the uh, R day yesterday, but the Goldacre review has all kinds of stuff in there about reproducible analytical pipelines, the use of secure data environments, trusted research environments. And we've also um, had you know, legislation put in train to establish um, the uh, integrated care boards, integrated care systems, and within that, the expected use that they will use data collectively across, across their patch to do things like population health management. Um, and taken all together and based on where I sit in NHS England, um, I think reproducible analytical pipelines, they are very much here to stay, they are very much the future, they are, they are going to happen. Um, the use of trusted research environments and secure data environments, again, you know, that, those policies are already being published, they, they, are, they are happening. And in both of those cases, Python almost certainly is going to be at the heart of doing that well. Already we see in Open Safely the need to use both R and Python to, to use that, that TRE effectively. And I think the more that we link data up in, in ICSs and, and ICBs, again, the more there is options to really learn about important behaviours and relationships and patterns um, longitudinally across a population that can genuinely make huge differences to what we know about the planning of whole health and care services, but also for individuals' health as well. Um, and so it is genuinely a very exciting time, I think, to be part of the, the NHS Python community. So um, number one, congratulations for being sat in this room today. And, um, and, and number two, I, I, it's just very exciting what the future, the future may hold um, in terms of reproduced line of pipelines, the secure data environments, ICSs, population health management, the move to a more digital profession, um, the use of, of, of open code and, and, and RAP in, in data science. Again, you know, data science and data scientists, their numbers just continue to grow and grow uh, off the back of the um, Goldacre review on behalf of um, Ming Tang as the Chief Data Analytics Officer in NHS England. I am leading the setting up of an open code and a reproducible analytical pipeline oversight group um, with members from this very good audience and also um, looking at uh, various parts of the commitments to the profession in, in, in Chapter 1, which also relates a great deal to how um, data science, uh, open code, um, open analytics, 
and reproduce plumbers pipelines get delivered. So it is genuinely, I think, a very, very exciting time for us all. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, the, to the, the day ahead and many more of these types of events. So um, happy to take a few questions, but I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Hello. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, what questions do we have? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, okay. Tiago, did you have a question? No. Adam? Uh, what are the main cha oh sorry hi I'm Adam uh, NHS Digital. Um, what are the main challenges that you see for sort of implementing RAP on sort of like a trust level, and how do you think we're going to overcome those? I think the challenges to implement RAP at a trust level are basically the same challenges to, to do a, a great deal of the kind of data science, open analytics type things that we we talk about, and um, the the. The GDS, the Data Science Accelerator, talks about, and I always remember this, it's a very nice way of thinking about it, the three Ts, tech, time, and training. And I think that applies in so many cases and particularly applies here. What can we do to actually get the right tech to colleagues' interests? What can we do to actually um, give them the right training? And specifically with training, that isn't necessarily about sending people on courses because in the, in the, in the, in the data science accelerator you don't actually get sent on any courses but what you do get given is an appropriate technical mentor who is always there for you who will always ask you questions who's done these kind of things before and that is a really hard challenge i think in trust to get that kind of technical mentoring in place so the tech the training and then obviously just the time the time to actually do something that's not necessarily going to work that is going to be harder the first time my example of using pandas it was so much harder than doing it in a spreadsheet the first time, to the point where it's almost you know, too much of a high barrier to entry. And many people will, if they haven't got that time and they don't feel the confidence to take that time, just won't bother. Um, and so I think, yeah, those three things together are, are really what we need for the actual analysts themselves. That, in isolation, also isn't enough because you need the, the wider thing of actually senior managers seeing the point in this, seeing the point in investing in the time, the tech and the training as well. Question at the back. Okay, so sort of off the back of that, and this isn't overly a question, but feel free to respond. How do we um, make sure that when we are demonstrating our work and giving examples, we're pitching it at a right level that invites people to use it, but is also professional? So when we put the examples out, we're often, we've spent a lot of time developing them into really nice tools, but actually that then looks like quite a barrier to a new person at times. So what's that sort of level of sharing really good quality stuff versus sharing stuff that people will be actively ready to just engage with quickly? <clears throat> when you say people engage, just to be clear, are you meaning other um, data professionals to take the work and use it, or yeah. you mean senior colleagues to think that's good on no, your own? No, more, more other analysts across the NHS, more data scientists, anyone who's actually going to use the tool. Um, so, for me, uh, the ability to actually very easily explore under the, under the bonnet before, I think it was one of the talks yesterday, one of the... Um, the clinicians said, "Give a give a man a fish, and he'll you know give him give him a rod." And it's a similar similar thing. If you just give them a finished product and go, "Isn't that great?" It will you know they'll think that's nice for five minutes. But if you can in any you know in any way help people to see under the bonnet more easily, that is when it's much more easily used. So there's two things there really. As we were talking about yesterday, it's not it's not a novel idea, but how you actually annotate your code and actually how you lay out your code is a huge thing to allow people to follow it. And then number two, and um, it's like you've planted this question, Johnny, but you genuinely didn't. You actually need some kind of um, almost dummy data that you can then use alongside the tool, like synthetic data that can then be plugged in alongside it, so that you can instantly see, oh right, that goes there. I see how it works. I can now see how my own data could potentially work with that. So I've got a... Oh, there is one more question. Dan, you have a question? Oh, sorry. Okay. 
uh, as a clinician, I could add to this last one. Uh, so one way how to make it easy is to put out variables that you will allow the user to change into a properties file or some form of text file that they can easily change without being intimidated by the code. Dummy data is extremely important and you should have an easy method. Let's say you are kind of analyzing something of time value. You should have an easy method how you can update this dummy data for data to be um, today's data. Basically move all the data kind of from last year to today because it's very, very convincing. And then if people run some visualization, and if they have changed some data, it's extremely impressive that they can see the immediate changes. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question from online. Could I have the mic, please? Thank you, Pete. Um, so somebody asks, how can a junior data analyst sign up to the data science mentorship to help learn more about the subject? Well now, um, so <laughs> I know we're in the Python room, but I think we are friends enough with the NHSR community that we're allowed to also plug their stuff. And I believe that they have a mentorship scheme that's about to get up and running. Um, I think the Analyst uh, X, as I said, the Machine Learning Mondays and their data science community is a great place to go. All the um, different Slack channels for Python and R, a great place to, number one, pick up hints and tips, but number two, from that, you will probably realise who's going to be is being the most helpful and are perhaps worth also sort of following up with further questions. Um, obviously, apply for the Data Science Accelerator if you really want to, to you know, go that path. As I say, it is very much open to people that work in health and care in the NHS. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, perhaps not quite a, a mentorship if you're already a junior data scientist, but probably worth being aware of the fact that we, um, within our unit, run by um, Johnny and also supervised by, um, by Dan and Paul, have a, a PhD internship scheme for data scientists who are currently studying data science like PhDs and this is a, a great way to um, come in and understand a bit more about actually how the, the NHS works, the data it holds and from our point of view we get the absolutely you know fantastic skills from, from academia for a flexible placement um, and in, in that respect uh, the relationship is such that they get the, the mentorship of one of our senior data scientists um, but in return, I think it'd be fair to say that our senior data scientists often learn a lot from our student placement, so it's a really mutually beneficial kind of arrangement. <laughs>